In the third quarter of the 1984 Super Bowl, Apple Incorporated aired a 60-second commercial in which a running athlete hurls a hammer at a giant visage of Big Brother. This depiction of an Orwellian IBM world shattered by the new, friendly, and revolutionary Macintosh didn't simply introduce the computer. It also established Apple's powerful brand image. This power can best be displayed by the existing state of the Apple brand. Think about it. The company has developed and cultivated a following among its consumers at an alarmingly quick rate, at a humongous scale, and in a way that Microsoft, Dell, Intel, and other computer-related companies quite simply have not. It's almost as if Apple has some of the hallmarks of not just a well-run brand, but a religion. And Steve Jobs, the founder, savior, and leader of Apple, is sort of like the patriarch of that belief system. In regards to intensive public relations similar to that of Apple, Steve Hayden, a branding expert for the advertising giant Ogilvy & Mather Worldwide, who actually were infamous for creating the Super Bowl commercial for Apple, said that people like leadership, not dominance. Steve Jobs certainly understood this concept. It's seen in how he addressed an audience. He presumed that they shared his values and regarded them as so. He was known for using words like we and us, not I. This collaborative dialogue was not only in Jobs' speeches, but also among Apple ad campaigns. To put this more eloquently, professors and experts in consumer research, Craig J. Thompson, Eric Reinfleisch, and Zeynep Arsel, preached the importance of creating a feeling of shared ownership with consumers, not one of dominance. They proclaimed that consumers are commonly portrayed as enthusiastic partners who engage in intimate dialogues with other brand users and brand managers to create mutually beneficial, identity-enhancing, community-building, and loyalty-sustaining meanings. It can be easily seen that Apple consumers are more than willing to tirelessly attempt to convert other consumers to Apple products. With this, you see the Apple consumers acting as brand missionaries, flexing a loyalty that's almost beyond reasoning, and using an intangible brand knowledge that actually, for the most part, has little to do with the product itself. Along with Jobs' collaborative dialogue, he wasn't scared of the word love. And I think it's safe to say that Apple consumers really do love their Apple products. For the most part, they don't just admire the Apple brand, but they respect it too. Now, you may be thinking, you know, you're talking about a brand, right? Not a human being? Well, I do know this. In fact, the humanistic description of a brand is all in the nature of the time-honored concept of corporate identity. In fact, authors and experts in business ethics, Ian Ashman and Deanna Winstanley, has said that, Obvious personification is generally intended to influence corporate clients with such human facts as values and conscience to reach out to important stakeholders. So, corporate identity is a persona that is created for the benefit of individual business strategies. It's most commonly used in how brands use trademarks. However, for the purpose of this investigation, identity is seen as a branding tool to create a relationship between Apple and its consumers. It creates an anthropomorphic notion, where human characteristics are attributed to an abstract concept, which is, in this case, the Apple Corporation. Apple uses corporate identity to personify its brand and subsequently to resonate with its passionate consumers. As stated by Longinus Marin and Salvador Ruiz, authors and experts in business ethics, the extent to which people identify with an organization is dependent on the attractiveness of the organizational identity, which helps individuals satisfy one or more important self-definitional needs. Hmm, needs. So, apart from providing consumers with technology, we must also provide them with an identity, that is completely emotionally based. And when brand meanings are forged among large groups of consumers, the shared meanings make it possible for people of all walks of life to relate to the brand. 
It takes us back to the way that Steve Jobs chose to reference his followers by using affectionate, passionate, and inclusive terms. This makes it feel like Apple is something more of a relationship partner. This happens when the product becomes embedded within the consumer's lives. As stated by emotional branding expert Mark Gobb, consumers today not only want to be romanced by the brands they choose to bring into their lives, but they absolutely want to create a multifaceted, holistic relationship with that brand. And this means that they expect the brand to play a positive, proactive role in their lives. This can be seen in Apple's strategic marketing of enforcing the idea that their products are a part of the life stories and memories of the families and individuals. Correspondingly, Kevin Roberts, an advertising expert, has stated that, from an emotional branding standpoint, brand strategists should focus on telling stories that inspire and captivate consumers. These stories must demonstrate a genuine understanding of the consumer's lifestyles, dreams, and goals, and compellingly represent how the brand can enrich their lives. According to Timothy DeWall Malafet, Vice President and Director of Cultural Studies at BBDO Worldwide, companies do not employ vendors to track consumers with the largest technology. They do so through the potentialities of their brand. Entire departments, managerial teams, and marketing initiatives, programs, events, sponsorships, and promotions. The task is to carefully align their brand's particular identity with the lifestyles, values, and identity of the corresponding target consumer they aspire to attract. Apple has learned that emotions are the action-provoking core of their consumers, and they've learned that emotional branding is the key to marketing success. Dr. Grant McCracken, an anthropologist and cultural and business expert, affirms this by stating that, The consumers actively seek products and brands whose cultural meaning corresponds to their identity and aspirations for constructing and maintaining their social self. Now, each year, people allegedly introduce over 3,000 new brands to the market. So, how can we, as consumers, possibly choose the right ones to be an extension of ourselves? Well. Apple has shown that through emotion and family-driven campaigns, they can answer that question for us before it's even asked. In accordance with this, Professor of Sociology at the University of Lancaster in the UK, Lucy Suchman, has said that the brand's influence is widespread and persuasive, even it's virtually indistinguishable. The age of mass production and competitive marketing The manufacture of difference through branding has become the hallmark of corporate success. Once jobs really clamp down on the look, feel, and mystique and consistent opposition of Microsoft's marketing, as Jobs once said, the only problem with Microsoft is that they just have no taste. Apple products became the number one in mobile devices and computing devices in the industry. Under Steve Jobs, and between 1996 and 2011, the market cap at Apple has increased from somewhere between $3 billion and $347 billion, with a short stint as the most valuable public company in the world. I guess this just goes to show that their branding technique really does work. David Acker, a preeminent marketing theorist, has said that a brand personality can be defined as the set of human characteristics associated with a given brand. Thus, it includes such characteristics as gender, sex, and socioeconomic class, as well as such classic human personality traits as warmth, concern, and sentimentality. So, how do we describe Apple? Oftentimes, it's described as thoughtful and prestigious, clean, revolutionary, inventive, and precise. And when you think of the consumers of Apple Incorporated, they really can't be called just that. Instead, they're also supporters and followers and dedicated servants to the brand. I suppose that the irony of it all is that these descriptive words and the intense dedication that consumers do have to the brand directly opposes the very premise of that original commercial that aired during the Super Bowl. Now, yeah, Apple is crushing the competition, but it certainly isn't setting the masses free. 
Instead, it's just directing them to the next Apple store where they can get the next iPad. Within the clutches of emotional branding, it's almost inevitable that consumers feel that they're a part of something more than just a technology company. And that's because that's what's presented to them. It's a psychological construct that represents more than just a brand. And Apple definitely has understood this concept. Just take a look at all of their campaigns. They're not just providing technology to families, but they're providing a lifestyle.